Indiana in the late 1800s looked very different from the Indiana of today. Not even a century into statehood, its primary industry was agriculture, and it was still fighting for significance on a national scale. In 1876, however, a discovery was made that would change the fortunes of the state and its people. Miners had discovered what was, at the time, the largest gas field in the world, promise of this seemingly endless natural resource would soon draw hundreds of new factories and thousands of workers to what was previously a sleepy Midwestern state, making East Central Indiana a hub of industry, trade, and culture, and changing the face of the Hoosier state and the nation forever. The gas boom in East Central Indiana uh, ran from about 1886 to about 1901. Gas was discovered in Delaware County in Eaton in the late 1870s, uh, but the folks who dug the well and found the gas didn't realize the treasure they had, and they simply capped it and went about their business for about another 10 years. They didn't know what to do with it at that point in time. And it was kind of wild what happened. Uh, what it was is that there was a gentleman who was digging a well. And as he got fairly low down on there, he started to hear a hiss. Now he thought it was like some sort of snake or something like that. He had no clue what was going on. So what he decided to do was to lower a bucket with a candle in it down into the bottom of the well. Well, you know what happens when you light natural gas, and that's exactly what happened here. There was a massive explosion, and nobody knew what to do. This thing just kind of jetted blue flame into the air for probably a week. Finally, the guy just uh, got the dirt around it. He just said, okay, I'm gonna fill it in. I can't figure out what else to do, so he filled it in. In 1886, people were drilling to try to find out who had natural gas, and what they found pretty quickly was that there was an immense underground reservoir of natural gas. The geologists quickly established that this large reservoir extended through this 5,000 square miles. So that was the area where the gas boom really developed. You can say the gas boom took off with the Wainwright Wonder. That was a large gas well, one of the largest gas wells really in the Midwest. The Wainwright Wonder was really an epic well. Um, literally, you could throw a rock in it and it would throw it back out. There was that much pressure behind the gas. It took them about three weeks to actually cap the thing. They actually did advertisements about, come see the Wainwright Wonder. It's interesting to look at a newspaper from that time period, from 1887, because you'll see in big headlines, the Wainwright Wonder is doing great, and look at all the gas that we found. And down in the bottom corner of the page, it says, Noblesville is now a city. 22 counties became the center of a new industrial movement in what had previously been an agricultural state. New gas wells were being drilled all over East Central Indiana. And as news spread about the abundance of the energy source, the search began for businesses that would make the Midwest their new home. Oh, it was immediate. Um, there was a lot of excitement about the discovery of gas, and uh, it was certainly well known that, that this was happening here. Everyone saw dollar signs and lots of opportunities, so people started moving in right away. They started laying mains almost immediately, late 1886, 1887, to homes and, and uh, businesses. So that was the first sort of uh, manifestation of the gas boom. There were big syndicates, land syndicates that were formed in Muncie, for example, that bought up land for factory sites and where uh, residential uh, additions could be subdivided for future workers' houses. But I have to say that the boom started with local people. There were local uh, business leaders uh, that formed boards of trade or uh, committees to lure industry to town. Greentown was basically just a farming community with about 450 people. Um, shortly after that, three or four years later, it was over 600 people. And shortly after that, when the glass factory was built in 1894, 
there was probably close to a thousand people. When gas was found here, there was such an abundance of gas here that um, a doctor and some other investors decided to buy some land and give that land to the glass factory in hopes of enticing them to come here. In Muncie, James Boyce, who was in some ways the father of the gas boom in Muncie, and his, one of his biggest success stories almost immediately was a, a, attracting the attention of Frank Ball. The Balls started their business in Buffalo, New York in uh, 1880, not initially making glass. Uh, got into that in about 1884, and that was when the first ball jar was made in Buffalo. By about 1887, early in 1887, they were looking for some place to build a branch factory, so both Ed Ball and Frank Ball started making visits. While Frank Ball was in Bowling Green, Ohio, he got a telegram from some businessmen in Muncie asking him to come over here. So he came over to Muncie, looked around, the businessmen took him on the tour. Initially, he was not impressed with the town, but he said he found that the businessmen were all uh, very intelligent, very businesslike, very kind, and he was impressed with the people and so they decided to build a branch factory here and started building in about September of 1887. Well, Kokomo Opalescent Glass began in the very late 1800s, 1887. Um, it was founded by a Frenchman, Charles Edward Henry. Mr. Henry was born in uh, Paris, France in the 1840s. He migrated to the United States in the early 1880s. The natural gas discoveries uh, were around 1886, and they were all in this area of Kokomo. He came to Kokomo, uh, was offered some free natural gas and a free site for this factory, and started producing glass. There were 5,000 gas wells in the state of Indiana. There was competition. There were 15 glass factories within this city at one time. Mr. Henry took some of his opalescent glass and put it on a boat and went to the Paris World's Fair, which back then was known as the Paris Exposition. Though many pieces were broken on the journey over by boat, he still got a world acclaim for his glass. And as a result of, of taking his glass there, uh, two great things happened. One, uh, he received a gold medal for his glass. The second thing was he received $50,000 worth of orders in 1889. That's a fairly significant amount. Natural gas is a key component to glass production. You've got to think of the fact that manufacturers were attracted that needed extremely high heat in order to produce their manufactured product. And fuel to produce that very high heat uh, before the gas boom was very relatively expensive. There were two waves of factories. Initially, the big cities, the county seats, attracted uh, things, glass was one, but there were also uh, paper factories, straw board, which was a kind of early cardboard, I think, brick factories. There were uh, farm equipment factories that made it one factory in Muncie made corn planters. And then there was a second wave of factories in the mid-1890s that the large cities attracted. And this was uh, included steel, iron and steel manufacturing, rolling mills, they called them, where they would produce uh, bars of steel or iron. So there was a lot of bigger than life boomers and industrialists. Lured by incentives of cheap gas and free land, 162 new factories were built and 10,000 jobs were created in the state by 1890. Previously, rural towns became booming, affluent cities overnight. New city centers boasted shops and opera houses. Residential neighborhoods and schools were built to house and educate the growing populations. The people of East Central Indiana were enjoying a heyday of community and culture, all thanks to the prosperity brought by natural gas. You had other people coming in, you had businesses coming in, you had people 
who were more educated, who were from bigger cities, who came in here and really developed an art scene for one thing. It brought in both visual arts and performing arts. You just, you offered a lot more opportunity for people in this city. For all different types of retailers, uh, professional people, um, entertainment, uh, people who lived in town already could get maybe better paying jobs. Schools, uh, you had to educate the folks who came here, the, the children of the people who moved here. So you, had, you did have a big building boom. Well, you know, of course I wasn't there at the time, but my father was and my great aunt that worked out in the glass factory. And they said at, uh, at Red Key, or just south of Red Key, they just drove a like 20 foot pipe down in the ground and because of the dome of the gas was so close to the surface, gas just rushed out, they lit it, and it burned for months and months and months, just for no reason, said it was so loud that you could hear for miles the roar of, the, of gas burning. They placed giant flambeaux along the streets, which were basically just torches. People would pipe gas, for example, down Main Street, and then periodically there'd be a pipe coming out of the, the, the curb or the sidewalk and at the type of the pipe there would be gas coming out which would be lit. So they were very bright, they illuminated the streets, they ran them day and night so it was like being in daylight downtown. Farmers would run them day and night, the chickens would get disoriented because they didn't know whether it was day or night when they were out looking for feed. So it was a rather surreal kind of environment to, to live in. While the main product of gas boom factories was glass, with 21 new glass factories finding their home in Indiana during the boom, many other industries prospered during this time as well. Already nicknamed the Crossroads of America, Indiana was able to transport these goods in and out of the state on her railroads. Thanks to the era's spirit of optimism and productivity, the gas boom acted as a catalyst for innovations that would revolutionize industry and modernize society. The railroads thought in terms of interconnection. And of course, in Indiana, because there were no other, there's no big lakes, there's no big rivers or anything like that, they just turned it into one giant X and just started drawing all the lines from like Cincinnati and Chicago and St. Louis and everything else. The population uh, influx because of the gas boom, yes, that, that certainly helped with people movers and things like that. But at the same time, um, for instance, the Midland was notorious for unreliability. Um, they actually managed to get mail trains late. They, they had all sorts of problems with that. And the others were more concerned with freight than passengers. They were also filthy. Um, steam railroads tend to be very, very dirty. When the Interurban was built in 1903 and went down a separate way, that was clean. It was electric, of course, so it didn't have that kind of problem. It was fast and it was oriented towards passengers, which meant that it was all about getting people from point A to point B. So as a result, um, that was a very, very popular way to travel. When the railroad was first built, uh, they thought they'd be more directly affected. As a matter of fact, that's why they built, for instance, this railroad down the middle of the street. They literally viewed it in 1851 sort of the way we view a delivery truck. Well, actually that doesn't work obviously, and railroads got bigger and heavier and smokier. And so as a result, the businesses, um, what grew up here was the industrial businesses and the retail businesses eventually moved away from that railroad track itself. The Shock to Tire and Rubber Company, which is over on the Midland track, that was built there specifically to take advantage of the railroad. Obviously, if you've got a large rubber company, you want some way to bring in big products. Now, of course, it's kind of ironic because they're making tires for automobiles, which were eventually going to replace this railroad. The beginning of automobile manufacturing occurred simultaneously with the late gas boom uh, and the development of this industrial capacity, these machine shops. The best story uh, from the gas boom era is the story of Elwood Haynes. Elwood Haynes uh, was born in Jay County. When gas was discovered here, he was instrumental in developing the gas fields that were here and developed a pipeline system that helped send the gas all the way to Chicago from this region. In that process, 
A lot of byproducts were produced, of course water, but there was also a type of liquid that was like gasoline. And because there was so much of it, uh, he invented an engine to burn the gasoline and then, of course, invented the first automobile. Mr. Haynes developed the automobile um, because he was wearing horses out in the field. He was field superintendent of the Indiana Natural Gas and Oil Company. His work took him from gas well to gas well out in the, in the counties. He was wearing horses out at a furious rate. And in 1891, he envisioned a horseless carriage and designed it all through 1892. And in 1893, he took his design to the Riverside Machine Works here in Kokomo, uh, where the Apperson brothers, Elmer and Edgar, built the automobile for him under contract for 40 cents an hour. On July 4th of 1894, they test drove the automobile for the first time on Pumpkin Vine Pike, giving birth to the first commercially successful gasoline-powered automobile in America. Indianapolis, because of the industrial capacity there, was a natural place for early automobile manufacturers to start and became a rival to Detroit in terms of manufacturing automobiles up to about the 1920s. The automobile industry might not have taken root in Indiana. Indiana. Um, there might not have been an Indianapolis 500 or an Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That might not have ever developed uh, if it had not been for the gas boom. With the factories and workers rolling in, East Central Indiana saw prosperity like it had never seen before. Within three years, over 200 companies in Indiana were drilling and distributing natural gas from more than 380 wells. And by 1897, over 5,400 wells had been drilled. Communities, proud of their newfound prosperity, celebrated their abundance of natural gas. However, a day would soon come when they would regret this failure to conserve their precious natural resource. It was uh, quickly, relatively quickly uh, lost, and there have been estimates that had we conserved it, had we known how to uh, handle it and not wasted it, we'd still have that gas today. The gas pressure was dropping, beginning to drop as early as 1892 or 93. That was a danger sign. He began to warn people. The legislature passed a law prohibiting the burning of flambeau. The problem was it was not enforced. No sheriff wanted to risk the ire of the local people by keeping them from burning their flambeau, which again, they thought of as billboards, advertising this limitless gas. It was a lesson that we haven't necessarily learned that our, our resources are finite burning it uh, day and night, uh, giving it away, um, pretty much unregulated uh, use of the gas was the downfall of that era. I suppose there were some people who had their heads in the sand that really couldn't imagine that gas would run out. Now what stayed, even in these small towns, were the main streets, the business buildings, the churches, the fraternal lodges, maybe some of the homes, the larger homes, and some of the cottages, so there'd be something that was left. But these cities would shrink to towns, shall we say. We don't have any written proof of when it finally ended. Um, we know that the glass factory itself burnt in 1903, and it was starting to wane then. After the fire, Greentown basically just idled down to nothing. I mean, there was no industry in Greentown other than, you know, we had a, a brick mold and, and uh, a lumber yard and, and things like that. Um, we didn't have any other industry, big industry, until the late 40s when they put a cannery out where the old glass factory used to be. And it just fell back into a nice farming, quiet community. Experts estimate that because of the lack of regulations concerning gas use and the constant burning of flambeau, about 90% of the gas in the Trenton gas field was wasted during the gas boom. When the gas ran out, many businesses that had come to Indiana on the promise of cheap energy either shut down or had to move elsewhere. Others adapted 
and were able to stay in operation long after the gas ran out. And some businesses, owing their start to the gas boom, are still around today. The gas boom hadn't happened. Industrialization might have happened over the next hundred years, but it would have taken longer, probably. It wouldn't have happened as fast. There not, might not have been the range of industries that developed. Well, they did have to find other energy sources, and probably for at least the first 20 or 30 years of the 20th century, it would be coal. I had uh, a guy that trained me as a lead person. When he was a little boy, his dad had a, a team of horses and a big uh, delivery wagon, and they delivered coal to the factory because the factory, the gas had run, started running out, it was getting pretty scarce in the area. So they brought in coal on trains and dumped it in big piles, and they would drag it up from the piles next to the train track up to the back of the, uh, the gas producer. The gas producer was like an oven that they put the coal in, and they made coal gas. And the coal gas run through tunnels under the ground up into the melting furnaces, and they burnt that coal gas to, to survive because the gas, the natural gas was, had been depleted in the area. A result of the gas being located here and um, our finding a way to send it to other places meant that as the gas ran out, we were able to tie into other sources of supply for natural gas and use that same distribution system to uh, provide gas to the industries that, that were here. The Ball Brothers, when the gas ran out, they actually did very well. They, they thought ahead. They didn't just make the glass. They branched out so that they, were, they bought Strawberg companies to uh, make the boxes to ship things in. Uh, they started making the lids. They made the white liners that went into the lids. So they established themselves as uh, the glass factory that could make the jar from beginning to end and ship it out too. Mr. Henry was a great glass chemist, but not a very good businessman. After owning this company for a little under a year, it went into receivership, and three local families stepped forward and purchased this company on October 7, 1888. Those same three families, along with uh, John O'Donnell, who is controlling stockholder today, own Kokomo Opalescent Glass. The overhead and expenses in the production of glass is pretty, pretty significant. So we don't produce glass the way we did a hundred years ago. Way back when Mr. Henry started this company, natural gas was free. We now have natural gas piped in to make our furnace function on a daily basis. Uh, that furnace is on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Well, when orders come in, they come in from all over the world. When you pick up the phone or open that email, you never know who's going to be on the other end of that attachment or that phone call. Um, we've shipped glass to Disney World, Disneyland, uh, shipped glass to a studio in Florence, Italy who made a window for Pope Benedict. You really never know where it's going to end up at from a very small community to the Vatican. Locally, it's in our own local Catholic churches, Methodist, Baptist, it's everywhere. While the gas boom is a lesson to future generations about the importance of conservation, the lasting positive effects of this brief prosperity are still felt. Indiana was transformed from an agricultural state to a hub of industry and culture, earning its place on the world stage. There are still very much lasting impacts from the gas boom. The rich variety of life, literature to some extent, uh, religious life, the, uh, the, these large, impressive churches. The city buildings definitely were reflective of uh, the architecture of the time and uh, where there are buildings still standing, they uh, are obviously were architecturally designed during that period of time. Any kind of building like that, whether it was a courthouse or a city hall built during the gas boom, was an expression of civic pride. Um, remember, too, that people uh, were trying to use their city as big advertising billboards for more industry, more investment. And so anything that was built was really an expression of both their pride in their city, but also to say, right, this is a great place to come. 
to, to live in, work in. And the legacy of the gas boom, I mean, what it meant for the state. The gas and bringing so many manufacturing concerns here helped make us into a manufacturing state. An industrial economy, perhaps laying the groundwork for the automobile industry. All of this was, uh, for the time, was made for a really, I, I think, a more diverse and interesting kind of, of, of life that people had. There's just a lot of interesting things in Indiana history that happened or were made possible by the gas boom happening here.